Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 23rd meeting of 2017. We have apologies from Mary Fee. Agenda item one is our fifth evidence session on Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill, and I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerks, and paper two, which is a private paper. I welcome our panel of witnesses this morning, Dr. Ruth Friskney, Research and Policy Officer Bernardo Scotland, Chloe Riddle, Policy Manager Children First, Megan Farr, Policy Officer Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, and Brandy Lee Luff Donnell, Policy and Research Manager LGBT Youth Scotland. And can I thank all the witnesses for providing written submissions, which is extremely helpful um, to the committee. And I now invite Questions from members, starting with John Finney. Hey, thank you, Vina. Hey, good morning, panel, and, and thank you for your contributions. I wonder, can you outline if you feel there's a gap in the existing legislation um, regarding domestic abuse and whether this legislation fills that gap? Please. So, um, thank you very much for inviting us onto the panel today. Um, the main gap is about the pattern, um, about coercion. At the moment, things um, like stalking and harassment can be um, can be convicted or um, reported, but the actual pattern of what we know, domestic abuse is really a pattern of control. It's controlling behavior, it's coercive. It's those things that reduce people's liberty and make them feel threatened or fearful or limit their activities in order to not um, provoke further, further coercion. So that's where the gap is and that's, um, our work with LGBT um, people, we know that that is um, a major gap in relation to what they are able to report. Um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, I think we'd really just echo what, what Brandy Lee said there. Um, I mean, we, we'd like to be clear that the evidence that, that Children First are providing today um, really seeks to strengthen the bill, um, but that we absolutely unequivocally support the, the bill and the need and recognise the need for it. In terms of the people that we support, nearly one in three of the children and young people that we work with, um, the parents and carers, are in some way affected by domestic abuse. Um, and we think that there's a need for a strong legislative framework to address the gap in the current law, in particular um, with respect to, to what coercive control looks like, but also, um, as, as we've highlighted in our previous evidence, the, the gap around children and young people and the, the experiences that children and young people have as victims, which we, we recognise has been included with respect to the aggravator, but we still think that there's a significant gap in terms of, of the way that children and young people are recognised as victims in their own right. Um, I think similarly we'd echo one of the things that women and children tell us about their experiences of domestic abuse is that they experience it as a whole environment, as a whole sort of course of behaviour and the gap that the bill fills is to recognise that course of behaviour and not to look at just domestic abuse as individual incidents. The work that the Commissioner's Office have done over the last few years and we did some research in 2013 and more recently we did a, a participation project with children and young people who had experienced domestic abuse, and that showed exactly the same sorts of things that the other panellists have talked about, where it's patterns of behaviour, where it's the cumulative effect of things that might not have looked at on an incident-by-incident -incident basis constitute, constitute abuse, but cumulatively they do, and that, that's what the children and young people have told us in our work that we have done. Um, uh, if I may, um, um, thank you all for that. Uh, uh, Chloe, in relation to the response from Children First, um, a quote here, you say, would have preferred a parallel criminal offence of domestic abuse against children to be included in the face of the bill. Then you go on to say, and I found this concerning, but you went on to say, we remain concerned that failing to recognise children as victims of coercive and controlling behaviour within the proposed uh, offence will make children less visible to services. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I, as I mentioned initially, we, we welcome the aggravation that's been included, but we remain concerned that the full impact of domestic abuse is not reflected in the bill. Um, and we think that, that if it were to be, to be um, fully um, reflected, that children would be more visible, that there would be more of a culture change and there would be more of a clear understanding about exactly what 
the impact of domestic abuse is on a child. Um, the, the focus that we're looking for in terms of parallel offences is, is around the perpetrator's behaviour. Um, we know from our services, um, we provide relational support and trauma recovery services to children and families. Um, but there are far-reaching, uh, long-term impacts, psychological impacts, as well as phys physical impacts of domestic abuse on children. We know from the research that tells us about adverse childhood experiences, of which domestic abuse is one, that there are significant impacts both on a child and then if, if they don't receive the, the, the appropriate trauma recovery services at an early stage, the impact that it can then have on their adult lives. Um, in terms of the, the impact that, that we know about um, on a child, we, we um, know that there are people who are, are living in a permanent fight or flight kind of a mode. We know that the, the women, in particular the women that we work with, I know that there are also men that experience domestic abuse, but the women that we work with um, are living with intense levels of fear. And so one of our support workers specifically said to me, how can we expect somebody who's living with that neurological response permanently to, to think about um, a, a nutritious meal for their child or getting them to school and all of these, these issues? We know that um, one of the support groups that we, we have uh, six six-year-olds and every single one of them is called 999 at least once in their lives and they're six years old. So in these cases, we think the bill as it stands doesn't recognise that significant impact and the perpetrator's behaviour, the way that the perpetrator um, perpetrates domestic abuse, um, and that, that's a significant gap, which would mean that if, if it was there, that it would make the child more visible to the services because there would be a clear recognition that the child was a victim, and it would also allow some of the services that perhaps don't fully understand um, the impact of coercive control on a child to look in a, in a different way. Um, and we, I think, as, as all of the others have highlighted, we think there's, there's a real clear need for, for access to services, access to trauma recovery services, and access to family support services for all the families that, that we know are affected by this. Does that answer your question? <laughs> is, is it not sufficient that there's an aggravation if there's a child involved? Um, I, th I think for us it's not a case of either or. We would, we would like both. Um, we think the, the, they provide the, a totally different perspective. The aggravator recognises when a child's in the household and, and the, the effect of the, the perpetrator's, uh, or the, the perpetrator's behaviour. But the parallel offence recognises a child as a victim in their own right. And, and this is, um, I think the, the, the best way of putting it is um, a reading out um, something that Scra said in their response where they talk specifically about the offence um, that can be the, the offence against an adult victim can be established with, the, with evidence of abusive behaviour directed towards a child through section 22B, but it seems anomalous for this to be the case without recognising the child's experience of abusive, of abusive behaviour as a separate offence. So the, the child can be recognised within the adult offence, but there isn't um, any provision at the moment for, for a, um, a, an offence against a child. Um, and, and that to us seems a, an anomaly. We'd agree with Scar on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, certainly. You may be asking the um, point I was going to raise. You're saying it's about children accessing services, but the Children and Young People's Act at uh, Section 9 um, says children's services plan to be prepared, that children's services in the area are provided in a way that best safeguards, supports, promotes the well-being of children in the area concerned, ensures any action to meet their needs is taken at the early, etc., etc., etc. And you'll be familiar with that. How does the introduction of an offence create a better way that children are supported that is beyond what's actually in the Children and Young People's Act? I don't understand the linkage between... Yep. The offence, which I think I'll acknowledge a case can be made for, yep. but children not getting access to services, it seems, at least prima facie, that the, the legislation already makes adequate provision. Um, I think for, for us, it's, it's not simply about access to services. That's an element of it. Um, there are other reasons, as you said, for, for including this within the bill. 
in terms specifically of, of access to services, it's um, for us a recognition, a clear recognition that a child is a victim often makes it easier for, for um, the, the services to be available, to be for, for, a, for, for the visibility of the services to be there. Um, we know that the dynamics of domestic abuse and the way that it works, that often people don't recognise themselves as victims, that often services uh, don't recognise mm -hmm. um, people as victims, and that if a child is specifically recognised in this way, um, the, the visibility, their visibility increases. I think it's, it's not a case of saying it's just in the Children and Young People Act. We, we're not asking for anything around services to be included within this bill. The point I think that Children First were making is that that the, the visibility of this will, will facilitate a culture change, the, the, the recognition that coercive control is this pattern of behaviour um, and that it impacts not just on, on women or just not just on, on um, the, the person who's been abused but on children and young people. And it's, a, um, it's important that there is that access to services, the recovery services um, that we know that they require. But are, are you saying, now the Children and Young People's Act is not fully implemented, and I mm. accept that straight away. Are you saying that uh, there are barriers that exist and children are not getting access because there isn't an offence? No. If so, so if you're not saying that, why do we need an offence to give children access? And I, I'm recognising, Kavina, that the, the Commissioner also wants to say something, but perhaps first... I, I mean, I'm, I think the others can answer fairly well as well. For us, it's, it's absolutely not linking the need for an offence with the need for services. What we're saying is that if there is an offence in the legislation, it will, by way of, of the, the nature of, of the way it works, it will mean that children are more visible to services. We're not saying that there are... Um, that, that the offence itself will mean more services are available. In fact, we, we've repeatedly said that our, our services have got waiting lists. There are not enough services for children, but we want to make sure that the children that require help get it as quickly as possible, get it as early as possible, and that the effects of the domestic abuse on, on children are able to be, to be worked with, that there's family support services available. That doesn't mean that an offence is created and therefore there are more services. That's not how it follows. But, uh, but but I think that, that the, the point that, that we're trying to make is that, that by making sure that there is better training, by making sure that there is um, a, a clear sense of a child as a victim, that, that they will be more visible in terms of services. But perhaps the others might want to come in. Thank you. Um, I think the main benefit of, of a separate offence against children, and I want to be really clear what, what the ask is, and I think it's a, a collective ask from, from a group of women's and children's organisations, uh, and that's to have an offence that recognises the harm that's done to children when there is domestic abuse, either regarding their parent or within the environment they're living in. Um, it's not, and I think this has been misread a couple of times, it's not an, a, a, a defence of, a best, of uh, coercive control of children. It's the harm that's done to the children when there is coercive control in the environment in which they live. Um, the benefit of that is that increasing the visibility of children in these cases has a number of knock-on benefits. One of the important ones is the effect it has on decisions that are made in the civil courts. And we hear evidence both from, from um, children, young people and their parents, um, mostly mothers, but not just mothers, who contact our office that Sometimes there can be a conviction with regard to the mother, but because there is no conviction regarding the child, contact continues to be ordered, and the children feel very, very clearly that there is not safe. They do not feel safe. And any rights regarding contact with, with the perpetrator, because if they've been convicted, that's what they are, are contingent on that child being safe. And so I think the creation of a separate offence relating to children in the specific context of domestic abuse is one way of making sure that children have the same protection as adults in terms of this act. Now, the aggravator is also important, partly because they're complementary, partly because of the way that sentencing works in terms of an aggravator will be reflected in sentencing. Two convictions concurrently won't necessarily, um, and partly because it's a useful tool for prosecutors to also have. It gives them options depending on the situation, the old age of the child, factors like that. That's why we think it's really important that both 
the aggravation be strengthened, and we've talked about that in our evidence collectively, but also that the, there is a separate offence relation to children in this context. Very briefly, the section six of the bill that's before us, which is about presumption of relationship, I'm hearing something that suggests that you might draw it wider than simply where there is a presumption of, real, of a relationship that's an intimate one, which is in essence what the bill says, between the perpetrator of the abuse and a parent or someone having parental responsibilities for the child. Are you trying to draw it wider than that? Because if you aren't, you know, kind of we're discriminating against some children and, not, and, and including some and not others. In other words, what I'm saying is, you know, at this stage of the process, we appear to be opening up something really quite wide, and I'm just wondering if that's how you see it. No, not at all. Um, what we, we're very comfortable with, uh, and we agree very strongly with the definition of domestic abuse that's in this bill. Um, I think the language I used was to reflect that families are more complex mm. um, oh, yeah. and in fact, have always been complex. And if we are too narrow in our definition of children, um, we could ignore, for example, a child who was in kinship care. So it wasn't biologically the child of that household, mm. either parent, uh, but, but was still a member of the household and affected by it. If we just talk about household, the risk is that we exclude a child who's no longer living at home, who's living with a grandparent because of the abuse. Um, but I think the bill does this quite well in that it talks about a child of B, but it also talks about any other person. Um, mm. I'd like it to specifically say any other child or person, um, particularly in terms of the bits that are about children. Mm. Um, but that, that keeps the focus on the immediate impact, but also reflects that the family may not be um, mum, dad, two children, or biologically related to, to both mum and dad. It could include kinship care, informal fostering. Right, so we've got two further supplementaries. Are these small supplementaries? That was supposed to be a small one. I know, they kind of grew. I'm sorry. Fulton? <laughs> yes. hey, thanks, Convener. Um, as it currently stands, if, a, under, if there's a domestic incident, um, in a household, the children, if they are present or witness it, are referred to the children's reporter. Do you know um, offhand if that is likely to be happening? Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't see anything un under this bill. And do you think that might alleviate some of the concerns that you've got? So if somebody's convicted or not convicted, if somebody's charged with, a, with one of these offences under the new legislation, that there's an automatic referral to the reporter for any children in the household. Probably because the conveners asked about time just for one answer, probably from yourself or whoever. Um, I mean, I, th I think that um, I'm going to come at your question possibly slightly sideways. So what we are looking for in terms of a parallel offence is a recognition that when a person chooses to abuse their partner or ex-partner and that there is a child, they are also committing an offence against the child. Um, there are obvious impacts on the child in terms of welfare, but what we're also seeking to do is hold the perpetrator to account for how their behaviours are harming a child. And um, I think one of the things that we know from what children and young people say about their experiences at the moment is that they don't feel that they're recognised, they don't feel that they're acknowledged as victims of an offence. Um, and I think that you have heard evidence in other sessions about one of the hopes for this bill being that if it does reflect women's and children's experiences of domestic abuse better by capturing that course of coercive control much better, that women and children might be more likely to feel confident in the system and more likely to seek help. We might have more opportunities to intervene, both in terms of providing them with support and in terms of tackling the perpetrator's behaviour. So I think I just want to focus on the reason, one of the reasons for seeking a parallel offence being about holding the perpetrator to account, and that's not the same thing as supports that are put in place for a child. Is, is that, does that yes, that was a really good answer. Thanks. Yeah. A supplementary, Oliver? I just wonder when you talk about a parallel offence, this parallel offence would only be in relation to the coercive control that's in this bill. If you're talking about the wrong that's done to children and young people as a result of domestic abuse, surely that would want to go much wider and take into account physical 
domestic abuse and you know that, that that could cause just as much harm so if you're wanting to create a sort of a, a catch-all offense for for children i just wonder whether this legislation is the right place or whether there should be you know parallel legislation that creates a wider offense that, that covers that Sorry. <laughs> I, I think that we're all quite clear that this is absolutely the, the, the best place um, for a parallel offence because um, it needs to be seen within the context of the, the partner-ex-partner relationship. And, and when we're certainly, as Megan said, we're, we're not asking for an offence that is in, 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 in this bill um, in the absence of that existing relationship. And it's important that, that the, con the whole context is seen because of the way that we know that, that domestic abuse works um, it, and that the course of control works. We know that it's important that the perpetrator is held to account um, both for the abuse that, that is, is, may be occurring within the relationship, but also the abuse that, that, that may be perpetrated on the child. Um, and I think that, that for us, the, the, there is the best place to put it is, is within a domestic abuse bill, because we're talking about that very specific um, uh, offence against a child that's within the context of the other relationship. We're not talking about anything wider than that around... I know that the, the Child Protection Improvement Programme will be looking at some of those other issues and updating um, the, the, the Section 12 offence, the 1937 Act. What we're talking about here is coercive control and, and physical abuse with, uh, of, as domestic abuse within the context of that relationship that's set out in this bill. Megan? Just to, to add to what has been said, that the bill, and it's one of the strengths of the bill in the way that it's written, and I think it contrasts to the experience in, in England and Wales, it does include physical incidents as part of the course of behaviour. Um, so it, it will affect, it will include, the, I think, the, the incidents that you were referring to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mary? Convener. Um, it was really just to tease out some of the, the evidence that had been given um, by some of the members here today, um, and particularly the children first. Now, you highlighted in your evidence that greater consideration needed to be given to how the offence would apply to partner violence between uh, children and young people. And you highlighted how often you've worked with young people who've been coerced into performing uh, sexual acts against their will and the normalisation of certain sexual behaviours amongst young people and how that creates a, a pressure to conform. Um, so will the bill be able to address that, do you think? Or what more should be added and what more work needs to be done in that respect? Um, I, I, thanks for the, the question. I, I think that for us there, there was a particular concern about 16 and 17 year olds. Um, we know that, that um, there are issues about abusive relationships among children. Um, and that given that there are no age restrictions in the bill, um, we, we have specifically asked for particular consideration of how the bill, of how children and young people who are accused of domestic abuse will be treated in relation to any new offence created. I think for us, it's, it's thinking a little bit about um, children who are going through the criminal justice system um, and making sure that there are um, particular considerations of perhaps um, without excusing any behaviour or any abusive behaviour making sure that the, the criminal procedures are going um, as, as they should be, but that, that there is some element of child protection concerns here, particularly for children who've been coerced into um, a particular type of behaviour and where the inter interaction with, with child protection procedures are for, for children who are in abusive relationships. Um, I don't think that there's anything that we specifically think needs to go into the bill, but it's perhaps an issue around training. It's perhaps an issue for guidance. Um, we know, for example, that, uh, that some of the younger people that we work with have got... Um, numerous um, adverse childhood experiences themselves and sometimes that can impact on their behaviour. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is the importance of relationships, sexual health and parenthood education. We've been talking about the need to, uh, through Equally Safe and the delivery programme, to challenge some of the gender stereotypes, to highlight um, uh, preventative programmes that look at gender equality. 
Um, so for us, that issue is, I think, a, a prevention issue mm -hmm. um, as well as an issue around how pe children who are accused of abuse um, can be supported so that there's a behavioural change and also what, what their experience is through the justice system themselves because they will be children and not convicted as adults. So it's more the work around that then rather than actually through the bill itself. I was just wondering yeah. if anybody else would like to comment on that as well. Um, yes, the, there's a lot of work going on at the moment. Um, and there's a particular gap around 16 and 17 year olds in the children's hearing system. But that is something I understand is being dealt with separately. Um, I think um, that's probably the right place for that, that to be looked at. Um, but we would very much hope that any, well, we would, we would argue strongly that anyone who is under the age of 18 is, is treated as a child and in an appropriate way. Um. And I think just generally in terms of the work that goes on around, I think we were, you know, we were question whether there is enough recognition of coercive control in teenage relationships, whether that really gets picked up and identified, and whether when it is identified, if then young people have access to um, services that they can really identify with as young people experiencing coercive control. We have a couple of services specifically for young women and for young men as perpetrators and you know trying to find a service that they can identify with and really f find a home that they can find to, to um, work through their experiences. Um, I think Chloe also mentioned the importance of um, relationship sexual health and parenthood education and I think one of the things we'd emphasize in relation to that of the importance of that being accessible to um, young men as well as young women and including that there being messages that are really accessible to young men about what it's like to be a parent to be a father and um, we talk a lot about having equivalently high standards for fathers as parents as for, as for mothers as parents um, because I think we have a um, some work that goes on in Parliament with young offenders, and one of the things that has actually come up in that is young men asking, you know, worrying that they're not being a good enough father and asking for kind of more information, not feeling that they had enough input around that. And I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle in terms of challenging the gender stereotypes, the structural inequalities in society that contribute to domestic abuse, to coercive control in young people as well as older relationships. So do you think that, oh sorry, if you can, yeah, if you want to come into that, yeah. So I would absolutely echo everything um, my colleagues are saying. Um, one thing to highlight for RSHPE and any kind of preventative work is um, to absolutely ensure that it is um, questioning gender inequality and it is um, recognizing domestic abuse as a form of gender-based violence, but there needs to be a recognition that the messages that men receive are not only about perpetration and the messages that women receive are not only about um, potentially experiencing domestic abuse. We know that um, gay, bisexual, and trans men, um, particularly gay and bisexual men, the research shows that they're less likely than their peers to recognize abuse in their first, more, less likely to, ex sorry, <laughs> more likely to experience abuse in their first relationships than their peers, but then also less likely to recognize it because they don't see the public story um, of who experiences domestic abuse is women. So gay, bi, and trans men are not seeing themselves, and so then there's additional barriers to even recognizing it, let alone knowing where to access support. So that needs to be, um, gender aware, but also gender inclusive RSHPE. Thank you, and you've raised a couple of important points that I know colleagues are, are going to touch on later. And it was just to come back to a point that you made, and it was about the, the support that's there for uh, the coercive and that coercive and controlling behaviour that is between young people. I mean, do you think that is something that is recognised at the moment? Are, is there much recognition and support for that, or is that something that has to be developed alongside this? Um, I, I think I would certainly question whether it's always recognised. I, I think um, I remember um, a young woman who was a teenager in sort of a third relationship and had an expectation of abuse because that was the expectation that had been established from the previous relationships. So that clearly hadn't been picked up in previous relationships before she'd sort of got to that point. Um, so are we identifying coercive control when it happens in teenage relationships, or is our image of coercive control that it happens in those older relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chloe. Um, and I think that goes back to really the point that 
you were asking about services, about, about that recognition of what's happening within these relationships and the impact that an act can have, that if these children are, are or if there's a, a clear recognition of what coercive control looks like across Scotland and that there's a clear recognition of the behaviour, um, it means that children and young people will be more visible and it means that, that there will be more understanding of what that looks like so that the, the, the um, services that are available will be able to, um, to be meet you know, to, to be able to, to respond better to the children because we know who that they are who they are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rona, followed by Stuart. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about your concerns over section four two B, which is about uh, where a child sees, hears, or is present, and uh, you know, Bernardo's. You say that it sends a message that a child expressly requires to witness domestic abuse in order to be harmed by that abuse, and it's incident specific. So, I wonder if you could just flesh out a wee bit more of, of your concerns on that. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think it's worth saying we we do, of course, think the bill has progressed enormously, and the fact that an aggravation is in there is a really positive step. We think we don't think that it's really quite capturing the different ways in which. Um, women and children experience abuse together. Um, and I'm sure that colleagues will have other perspectives as well. For example, one concern is that potentially as the aggravator is currently drafted, it actually um, penalizes the efforts that work put the work that women put in to protect their children from abuse. Um, I was actually in training yesterday and one of the examples that came up was a woman who was experiencing domestic abuse, including quite severe physical abuse, um, and she was being strangled. And what she reported thinking at the time when she was being strangled was how important it was that she didn't scream, because if she screamed, then her child would become aware of the abuse. And what she most wanted to do was protect her child from that awareness of the abuse. And if you sort of think about that in relation to how the aggravator is currently drafted, you know, the more of that work she does, and we know that women do a lot of that kind of work, that child then might not be recognized. Not only is that child not recognized, but that element of how the woman is experiencing the abuse is not recognized. So I, I, that's one concern I might yeah. see if colleagues would like to add further concerns. Chloe, yeah. Um, I would really just uh, echo really what, what Ruth has, has said. Um, we, we clearly recognise the work that's gone into this um, and, and how far we've come. And um, our recommendations are to strengthen the aggravator um, rather than to criticise it. We think that the, the further clarification that's required is, is particularly around whether a child sees, hears or is present. Um, because as Ruth says, there is often a lot of work that goes into making sure that a child is actually not present. Um, we had questions specifically, um, and I think we heard from Scottish Women's Aid um, about if a child's out of the country or if a child's out at a sleepover or if a child is not specifically in the house but there's incidents occurring. Um, there was a UNICEF report into the impact of domestic abuse on children that found that those who are not direct victims, uh, those who are not direct victims, have some of the same uh, behavioural and psychological problems as children who themselves are physically abused or emotionally abused. And I, I think that it's really important to recognise that it, it, it that some of this, as it stands, is down to interpretation about whether a child is is there, if a baby is there, um, and or and also I think if it's um, financial control what does that look like if a child is not actually physically there so there's some work to be done we've suggested some language around whether or not the the perpetrator is reckless as to whether a child sees or hears there's perhaps some 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 better language um but it's definitely some an area that we're concerned about megan um we'd really like to see that the aggravator reflect as close as possibly the sort of language that's used when talking about the harm done to the non-abusing parent um, we feel that, that using phrases like sees, hear, or is present becomes far too much focused on an incident. That's what this bill yeah. has done such a long, mm -hmm. a lot to move away from. Mm -hmm. the, um, the aggravator, we really, really welcome the aggravator. We think it's a really, really vital tool mm -hmm. that prosecutors will have. We think it does a lot to recognise the harm that's done to children in yeah. the context of domestic abuse. But it seems to be a little bit too focused on a child's being present for an incident. As others have said, there is lots of different ways that children can be affected whilst being unaware of the abuse because their mother is doing her very best yeah. to protect them. 
I would also been thinking in terms of just the general tension in the house yeah. if, if a child and lives with that every day. Yeah, and, and there's really, really good body. affected by it. Yeah, yeah. there's re thanks that that's really there is a really good body of evidence now that, that says that where there is those stresses in a household mm -hmm. that, that children are psychologically harmed, that they yeah. do have long term impacts. Um, but there's also issues like controlling resources, um, controlling what you do socially. Um, the child may not know, the child may be a, a, a tiny baby and not know that it's missing out on things because its mother is, is, is shielding it, yeah. Yeah. but it's still being harmed. Yeah. Um, I think the example we used in our evidence was where, where financial control is being exerted, where mother doesn't have enough money to meet the child's needs. The child might not know. The other thing about why it's important to be in here and not in the context of child protection is that, that this bill is really, really does an excellent job at keeping the focus on the perpetrator. And when that focus goes away from the perpetrator, the real risk is we end up looking at issues like that, where a mother has shielded her child, but the child still suffers harm. We end up looking at, has the mother done a good enough job mm. at shielding the child, when really she has done absolutely the best job she possibly could yeah. in horrendous situations. So that's why I think that aggravator is, um, needs to more closely reflect the language um, of the main offence. Ruth? Sorry, I was just going to expand on sort of some of the examples because I think one of the things that we quite often see in terms of domestic abuse is that the actions and the behaviours of the perpetrator around the woman in terms of controlling her um, time, in terms of the inordinate amount of energy she then has to put in to trying to manage that relationship to keep things as safe as possible, the child then experiences as a lack. You know, the, the mother doesn't have as much energy as she might want to have to cuddle and play with her child. She doesn't have the time, you know, because she has to be doing certain things for the abusers at particular times. She doesn't have the time to help the child with homework. And I think the question is, would that be picked up by the current aggravating? Because we're not sure we can see a way in which it would be. Yeah. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Would, would that be difficult to evidence? Um, so I think it's quite interesting. Some of the ways that we end up talking about domestic abuse, we, we quite often seem to end up talking about a sort of environment of domestic abuse. And I think it's important that we always bring that back to that is an environment of domestic abuse that has been created by the perpetrator carrying out specific behaviours and actions. Um, we're actually just at the moment in, in the process of training a lot of our staff in um, Safe and Together, which is a model around domestic abuse approaches to child welfare. And one of the things that comes through in that model is the importance of actually really evidencing those behaviours of a perpetrator and then identifying how that has adversely impact on a child. And I think it is, it's, it, to be honest, it's quite a mind shift to go from describing he's doing a course of coercive control to he stops her leaving the house with both children at once so they never get to play together. He, you know, all of the different things in detail, you look at it together and it really is quite powerful. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think, I think that is something that possibly, I mean, I think we actually are trying to develop doing that much better and being much clearer about evidencing those behaviours and what he's doing and how it impacts on the child. I think if you can give four examples, it helps tremendously. Otherwise, it, it's looked at as kind of iri-fairy concept. It's difficult to pin down. But when you give a, an example, then it becomes pretty crystal clear. Chloe? Um, I think the question about evidence is important. I, I think some of these things are hard to prove. Um, we, we have examples, for example, in our... Uh, uh, in our family support services where um, uh, the abusing parent, the, the perpetrator, may, for example, take the car seat to work, which seems like an mm. innocuous um, a task, but actually um, what it's actually doing is preventing the child and the, and the mother from leaving the house. But the, the thing that I think we're clear about is just because it might be difficult, that it, it means that it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be ambitious, that we shouldn't be far reaching, and that there aren't ways to do it. One of the things that, that we have highlighted in our evidence is the importance of child witnesses and the work that needs to be to be done to make sure that the court system's not re traumatizing for child witnesses um, and that, that wider reform is needed, but that actually children will. will um, 
potentially be required to give evidence to corroborate some of the things that that has been that, that have been said um, and so that we're really mindful that that if children are going to be giving evidence more frequently um, or, or just in general that wider reform is needed um, for example through um, piloting a Scottish version of the, the Scandinavian barnhouse model for child victims um, we're mindful of some of the things that have been going on around um, for example uh, not being cross-examined but there are some steps that need to be taken to make sure that we get the best possible evidence um, and that witnesses are able to provide um, the best possible evidence to, to get that, that conviction, but doing it in a way that, that um, isn't going to be re-traumatising for the children. So I think the, the recognising the role of child witnesses and the steps that need to be taken is really important within the context of this bill. In terms of the, the car seat example mm. you get then, would that be followed through maybe with mens rea and the recklessness you know, when you actually question were you not aware of the implication mm. and then working backwards to that to, to then get into the impact on the child without actually having to interview the child? It could be the, the mens rea behind a lot of the... Yeah, I think there are some ways that that can happen, but there are also some, I mean, we know that some children do witness some things overtly. We're working with particular, in particular with some children who've um, witnessed sexual abuse, for example, um, and, and I think that there might be a case where they would need to, to, to be a witness. Um, but I think that the, the important thing also to mention when we're talking about children is the impact of of witnessing some of this abuse and it goes back to what megan is talking about about the perpetrator and this is this is the um the, the whole the whole bill's um provision around keeping the focus on the perpetrator's behavior and, it, and it's a deliberate choice if a child is witnessing something um and and how we can establish that within the bill um, um, and we don't think that the aggravator is enough to do that yeah. megan um, one of the reasons that we support the inclusion of a really strong aggravation, and we're, we're pleased to have the one we have, but, but we have specific requests about improving it, um, as well as a specific offence, why, why we think the two complement each other is particularly around the evidencing, um, in that an aggravator doesn't require corroboration. Uh, so that gives another tool to prosecutors where, particularly with very young children, with children who might not be able to give evidence, the aggravator could still be used to recognise the harm uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why our ask has, has been all along to have both of those as tools available to prosecutors. Yeah, that's helpful. Liam, you're just supplementary. And then I'll bring Ben in because I should have brought you in earlier, Ben. Thank you, convener, and thank you for your, your, your evidence so far. I'd, listening to, to what's been described, um, it's been helpful, as the convener says, to have um, specific illustrations of, of the sorts of, of behaviours and the interlinkage between those behaviours. You'll be aware, though, that the, the committee's also had evidence from some witnesses about, um, in the context of expanding the definition, which I think there's, there's pretty much universal um, agreement on, um, there have been concerns expressed around the, the, the thresholds and, and uh, that are set. Um, the mention was made of distress, the fact that um, a harm or serious harm would not necessarily have had to been proven, but the, the, the risk of that uh, demonstrated. What, to your mind, would be the, the, the safeguards within the legislation to ensure that, I think we all understand, at, at the extreme end, um, what we're, we're talking about, but the, the difficulty may come in areas where um, the, the, the level of abuse uh, may be more difficult to, 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 uh, uh, to evidence and where tensions, um, uh, unpleasant atmospheres, perhaps over a prolonged period in a household, um, don't necessarily constitute an abuse by one individual against a, a, another, um, albeit that there's certainly a situation that needs to be addressed, not least in, in the interests of any child uh, or children present in the household. What, to your mind, would be the safeguards in here to address the point that's been made about perhaps over-criminalising um, bad or poor behaviour, but not necessarily criminal behaviour? Right, right. In terms of this, I'd reflect on the, the existing difficulty of, of prosecuting even physical violence. Uh, so I think that the likelihood of that becoming an issue is, is probably quite small. But as Anne-Marie Hicks said in her, her evidence to you a couple of weeks ago, um, there are quite strong safeguards in the bill in terms of the three, um, three requirements. 
which I have lost on my notes, I'm afraid. <laughs> the three conditions um, regarding the, the fact that there was a course of behaviour that was abusive, um, that a reasonable person, and that reasonable person test is a concept that's quite well established, it's quite well understood by the courts, and um, I think is, is a major protection there for, against over-criminalising behaviour that, that may not constitute abuse. Um, and then the third condition, which is around intending to cause harm or recklessness about that. I think those three, and particularly I'm reassured by the evidence that Anne-Marie Hicks gave to you two weeks ago, um, that the bill has those protections um, and, uh, and, and that that's unlikely to be, that, that the sort of issues that you've described are unlikely to pass those tests, so are unlikely to, to be prosecuted, let alone convicted. Um, and, and would you see that as, as being something that would be un understood by those who um, may be viewing the passage of this bill as opening up an opportunity to, to bring forward um, uh, cases otherwise have, have, have not been uh, have not been heard? Was there a, do you think there's a clarity and understanding about the, the scope and extent of this bill, the thresholds that need to get, um, be overcome in order to, to bring a, a successful prosecution? The bill's still at stage one. I think that's a process that, that's going on. I think the conversations that are being had here um, over the, the few weeks where you've been, been taking evidence and the, the rest of the bill's passage will do a lot to hopefully reassure those people, um, hopefully also emphasise how vitally important having this bill <laughs> in place will be in, to protect uh, victims of domestic abuse. Uh, and uh, But I, I'm aware that the Scottish Government have said that they are planning to do some, uh, there'll, there'll be additional guidance, there'll also be um, awareness raising and training um, around professionals uh, and I think that'll address a lot of those concerns as well. Um, so at this stage I think there is, there is concern and it's right that people can express that but I hope they'll be reassured um, over the course of the Bill's progress through Parliament. Chloe? I think I'd just echo what Megan said about training. We've we've consistently highlighted that the, the importance, as I think other um, people who've given evidence have, other organisations, that it will be essential that there are there is training around what coercive control looks like, what survivor strategies are, what the dynamics of domestic abuse is, um, how the courts are used to perpetrate abuse, for example, um, and that we we know we've highlighted the need, for example, for clear jury directions. So I think it, it's not, as with all bills, it's it's not just a case of of sending the, of creating an act and then um, leaving it like that. There will be a course of um, a need for a course of training, a need for for awareness raising, and and other things that, that hopefully will be taken forward. Brandly. Um, just to echo um, the fact that um, LGBTU Scotland absolutely thinks the, um, the threshold is set at the right place and um, it, it's not likely that someone who wants to be vindictive because they're angry at a partner at the moment is likely to pass the tests um, in terms of course of behavior or in terms of reasonable person. Um, so just want to put that... Um, out there, but then also in terms of um, campaign awareness raising and training, one thing that we would ask for in relation to, and I know that this is a practice and implementation question rather than um, a legislative issue, but one thing that's really crucial to um, consider as um, the bill hopefully progresses is um, to make sure all training and guidance is fully inclusive of all protected characteristics. The previous um, Shakti Women's Aid um, spoke about BME women, um, and while it was particularly gendered, additional experiences that may appear um, reasonable on the, um, from the outside, that's also the case for LGBT people. Um, some examples are um, threatening to out someone um, it might not appear as threatening to out if a perpetrator says, I can't wait, I'm going to tell everyone about our relationship, but actually the person that's, that's experiencing the abuse is not out and that could threaten um, their social networks and their stability, et cetera, and that could be seen as a threat, whereas to someone that has not been trained on um, the dynamics of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, they may think that that's reasonable and quite positive. Um, Another issue is um, con continually using the wrong pronoun to address um, trans people or to undermine someone's gender identity or their um, sexual orientation. Those are some of the things that will need to be picked up um, in guidance and training. That leads neatly on, I think, to Ben's final yeah. question. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, uh, Brandy, you've touched on some of the, the 
points that I, I was I was going to raise, but I'll maybe just give you an opportunity to expand further if okay. if, if there are, are, are more things you want to say. Because, uh, as you suggested, including from your, your own organisation, the the committee has received evidence indicating that particular types of controlling coercive behaviour may affect certain victim groups, and, and particularly in, in, in today's evidence session, looking at the uh, LGBTI uh, individuals uh, from the LGBTI community. Uh, would the way in which the domestic abuse offences set out in the bill capture uh, these specific uh, aspects of, of and types of controlling coercive behaviour in, in your view? And uh, do the police and other criminal justice professionals have a sufficient understanding uh, of, of the issues at, at hand and, and, and is effort needed to, to make sure that that wider knowledge is, is, ex is expanded? Okay. Um, we would absolutely agree that the, um, the offence as written would be inclusive of um, LGBTI people. It is, um, it's, yeah, um, so it, it includes um, the course of behaviour and we know that that is, um, that's an issue that um, LGBT people experience. Um, there are particular barriers um, that then go to implementation and then kind of um, are to do with public awareness. And there are issues in terms of reporting and in relation to practice from the, through the criminal justice system. Um, so I don't know if um, you would have seen in our evidence, um, LGBT people can be um, reluctant to report domestic abuse because domestic abuse cases are seen in open courts and if someone's not out or if they don't feel comfortable talking about the relationship or what's happened, that can entirely put them off from reporting. Um, so um, we don't know how this will play out from this legislation, but this this bill, the the um, the way that the domestic abuse offence is written, absolutely would cover LGBT people. But it's how, how do we um, reduce those barriers? Um, I would say, in terms of um, Police Scotland and the Crown Office, they have done um, a lot of work. They are constantly working to be reflective and, and constantly learning about how to make their services more accessible. Um, and we've recently met with. Um, We've met with the Crown Office um, and, well, sorry, I insist um, to approach the Crown Office and we've met with the government around the issue of reporting and barriers and how can we um, change that practice so that LGBT people can more often report the domestic abuse they're experiencing. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm reassured that you, you feel that the, uh, the way that the legislation is currently drafted will, will cover um, the, the particular area that, that you focused on. and. I think we're all mindful that this, uh, the transition of this bill, and if passed as the will of Parliament, will require a, a wider awareness uh, training across many different uh, dimensions. And that kind of br brings me on to uh, another question I'd like to ask a convener, which, um, if you could perhaps expand, Brandy, from uh, the LGBTI community's perspective first, but I'd be interested to, to hear from the whole panel, because it's actually detailed in um, Children First's evidence where you said, we hope this bill will be the beginning of a wider cultural shift um, and driven by widespread a widespread public awareness campaign and broad ranging professional training about the dynamics and impact of domestic abuse. I'd be interested to, to, to hear more on that and um, how you all see the, effect, the potential effect of this bill in terms of raising greater awareness and, uh, and having a, an effect, effect on social change as well as a legislative development. Um, so um, my initial response is that it will more appropriately reflect what domestic abuse is um, by recognizing the patterns of control um, within intimate relationships. Um, so that in itself, in terms of recognizing what takes place, um, that will greatly increase understanding of what people are able to report, what they are able to get support around. Um, we've seen in previous evidence sessions where people approach um, you know, women's aids and other domestic abuse support services where they say, I don't know if I can get support on this. I don't know if it's abuse. Um, there was a, an LGBT domestic abuse helpline. Um, their, uh, their previous posters showed someone um, at the bottom of the stairs having fallen down. And that continued to perpetuate this understanding that domestic abuse is about physical harm rather than a pattern of um, behaviors that may include physical but actually are very emotionally and psychologically manipulative. Um, so for um, 
my initial personal response is that um, it will just raise awareness of what domestic abuse is as a pattern of controlling behavior between intimate partners rather than the stereotypes of physical abuse, and that will um, greatly increase people's understanding. And do you think in the LGBTI community that will encourage more uh, vi victims of domestic abuse to come forward and, and, and seek that's, justice within the system? That's the hope. Um, I would caveat that slightly by um, saying that there are still barriers to the reporting due to the open courts, um, but that's something that we are going to continue to try and push on and try and change, um, because that's practice related, but in terms of having legislation that fully supports people's experiences and their ability to take something forward um, and report it, that is a very positive step. Thank you. Um, uh, we would agree. Uh, I mean, as we said in our evidence, the, the, the recognition, the clear recognition within the bill that, that abuse can be both physical and non-physical, and that it's part of a pattern, that the perpetrator's behaviour is part of this pattern, um, and it's, it can be emotional and psychological is, important part, is an important part of the culture change um, that we think is required. Um, for us, it, it's also about making sure that, that children's right to be safe from harm, children's right to, to recovery, um, it is clearly recognised that it's, it's um, as, as uh, Brandy Lee was saying, that people who are in these relationships, in these circumstances, are recognising that, that what we're talking about is abuse and that there is help and support and services out there. Um, there is a clear statement within the UNCRC that children have a right to recovery. Um, and I think that part of that is it must be recognising when abuse has taken place and some of the, the more subtle types of abuse, as we mentioned before, things like... Um, withholding money for nappies or um, the the um, the car seat example that I gave before as well as some of the more dramatic um, types of coercive control and behavior um, can come together to form a pattern and I think that recognition um, throughout the, the bill and an awareness camp raising campaign and training will help people to understand what what coercive control looks like and will also encourage friends and neighbors and the community to to speak up in ways perhaps that they hadn't hadn't recognized before um, um, I think I'd echo that I, I, we sort of said at the beginning that what what we see in this bill is a much um, more effective recognition of the lived experiences of women's and women and children in terms of domestic abuse. And I think it also go, goes back to the question that we talked about earlier, which is about why we're seeking to make the way that children experience domestic abuse with their um, mothers much more visible. Um, and so, for example, one of the things we see a lot is children coming into our services and they're referred for a reason that has nothing to do with domestic abuse. So children comes in because of problems with attendance at school. And it's really important that you're able to look at what's going on from a domestic abuse informed perspective and take that step back and a um, particular example of where a child um, is so afraid of what the perpetrator does to the non-abusing parent when he's at school that the child doesn't want to go to school. The child wants to stay at home and protect mum. And if your approach to that child is to put burdens on mum and try and make her do more to get the child to school, that's not going to support the child's well-being. But if we can take a step back and look at it and understand the domestic abuse that's going on and how that's impacting on what's happening to the child, we've got a much better chance of actually <coughs> achieving change. So raising the visibility of children should then impact on that kind of cultural change as well. The you, legislation is used as a way of, of raising awareness as well as of, of prosecuting people. We've, we've done that in a number of ways, and I think this bill will go a long way um, to, doing, to raising the awareness of domestic abuse across society amongst professionals. But one of the pieces of work that the Commissioner's Office, together with Scottish Women's Aid, have been doing recently is around children's experiences of the civil court system, and particularly around contact. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the invisibility of the harm done to children by domestic abuse and the effects that, that can have, uh, and I think that that's another important thing where, where the bill will, will not just hold perpetrators to account, and that's vitally important that we do, but also raise awareness of that harm across society um, um, and improve the protection of children. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we need the stronger um, aggravator, why it's important to have a a parallel offence relating to children, but it's also one of the issues that could be covered by the non-harassment orders which are included in the bill. Um, at present, the non-harassment orders don't mention children. Um, what we'd like to see is that there's an if the aggravator is applied, 
or if there's a parallel offence. Um, but particularly, the aggravator is a, an excellent opportunity that the same um, condition be put on the court to consider an NHO in relation to the child, because children can continue to be involved in the abuse when they're not with the non-abusing parent by the perpetrators. And at, as it stands, the, the section regarding non-harassment orders doesn't give children the same protection it gives adults. And in some condition, situations, it may give children less protection after the abusing parent, the, the perpetrator, has been convicted than they had when the, he was on bail. Um, so I'd really like to see children given the same protection in terms of non-harassment orders as um, the partner does within the, act, uh, within the bill. Um, can I ask a little bit about contact centres? That's been raised um, from the very first evidence that we took informally on the bill and the fact that they can be used by an ex-partner to abuse or undermine the other parent. And now I think, following on from your evidence, Megan, perhaps harm the child? Yeah, I think with, with contact centres, um, what, what we hear is, and we hear it from professionals, is that uh, sometimes the understanding of the purpose of a contact centre isn't well understood, uh, even within um, the, the court system. Um, but in terms of the type of domestic abuse, that the way we now understand domestic abuse and the way that's understood in, in this bill, um, it, contact centres can't necessarily prevent the sort of, sorts of behaviour which involve children in abuse the talking about undermining the parenting of, of the other parent, using the child to spy on the non-abusing parent. Those sorts of behaviours are quite difficult to, um, to address through a contact centre, particularly since in, in a lot of cases um, it's, it's not supervised contact. Um, so the, the perpetrator could potentially be alone with the parent. Um, the, sorry, with the perpetrator. Um, I think there is a, a use for them in terms of um, where there is a serious risk. But the other thing about contact centres is um, they themselves have, the organisations that run them have said to us that they're intended as a short-term solution, not a long-term answer to an abusive partner. Um, and I think there, there's real issues about them potentially being used as that. Um, the, both, both children and their parents have rights around contact, um, but those rights are in the context of a safe environment. Children have, children's right to be safe must be the first consideration when contact is considered. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't a, a safe environment, uh, and in terms of the, the sorts of ways children are involved in domestic abuse that are, that, that are addressed by this bill, I'm not sure they can always provide that. And in any case, they're only ever intended as a short-term solution. Okay. Um, perhaps the other panel members might um, comment on the non-harassment order provisions generally. Um, I think we have some particular um, evidence on that. Was it social work? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Chloe? Um, <coughs> We, we um, yeah, as, as we said in our evidence, uh, children first would like to see a mandatory duty on the court to consider whether to impose a non-harassment order. Um, that includes a child in all cases where the statutory aggravation in relation to a child is applied. Um, as Megan said, we know that there are complex issues around contact and um, we know that, that there are issues around the civil courts and whether or not the civil courts would um, would uphold the, the non-harassment orders. So I think some of the other um, evidence that has been heard talked about whether or not non-harassment orders were effective, and we think that, that that's something that does need to be addressed, um, but it shouldn't prevent us from putting something within this bill to ensure that children are given the same protections as adults in terms of, of harassment um, orders. I think that... Um, um, in terms of the um, ongoing question about contact, um, it's really important not to shy away from the fact that perpetrators may continue to pursue a pattern of abuse through contact and non-harassment orders are, the, the consideration of a non-harassment order is part of a, uh, the tools that that, that abuse may, may be, be prevented. Um, for us, 
post-trial protections are absolutely critical for, for victim safety. We think that, as I mentioned when I was talking about child witnesses, a lot of the systems actually re-victimise. Um, I was really shocked to read one of the, the, the evidence submissions, the written evidence submissions from a victim who said that she would rather be abused again than go through that court system. And I think if you think about that with respect to children and the impact that some of that... that, that um, court processes have on children it's it's really traumatizing um we don't want there to be things in place that that would prevent women from talking or or um people who've been abused from talking about abuse because they're concerned about the court system. Um, and for us, the, the, the protection of a non-harassment order that can be extended to a child in all cases where the, the aggravations applied would be um, an essential part of protection for, for a child who's been a victim of abuse. Okay. Ruth? I, mean, I think we'd very much echo that. We, we really um, see that it would be entirely appropriate that partic particularly where the aggravation in relation to a child has been evidenced that the non-harassment order should protect the child as well as protect the mother. Um, and I think, you know, we all know that we can't equate um, the perpetrator no longer being there with safety. You know, we know that mm. perpetrators are capable of abusing women and children, for example, when they're in prison. So it's really important that non-harassment orders are put in place that cover women and children so that the perpetrator doesn't find a way around, go through the children to carry on continuing that abuse. Uh, Stuart, did you have anything else to comment? Yes, fairly briefly, I think. Um, Section 5, defence on the grounds of reasonableness. Now, I think this strikes the right balance. I'll say that straight away. Um, but presumably in invoking um, the behaviour was reasonable, in drafting terms, we're avoiding giving a list of the behaviours we thought might be reasonable because, of course, the circumstances will vary. And I really just want nodding heads almost to say that you're content with this section and we're getting them, Kimberly. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank the witnesses very much for what's been a very valuable um, evidence session and certainly put some different perspectives that we haven't covered so far. So thank you all very much for attending. We'll now suspend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses.
Okay. I welcome our second panel of witnesses, Erin Slater, Edinburgh Services Manager, Safeguarding Communities, Reducing Offending Sacro, and Catherine Sharp, doesn't look like, yes it is, um, member of the Criminal um, Justice Standing Committee, Social Work Scotland, who is intending in place of Jane Martin as originally notified on our agenda. Okay, you're both very welcome and thank you very much for your written submissions. And with that we'll move to questions. Could I start perhaps asking Sacro about um, the Fearless Project and um, what that's on there? Sure. As so Fearless is a uh, domestic abuse support service for hard to reach victims of domestic abuse, uh, specifically men, LGBTI plus and black minority ethnic communities. Uh, it's a partnership between SACRO, LGBT Youth Scotland, Shakti Women's Aid and the Men's Advice Line. Uh, so we operate across eight different regions in Scotland providing one-to-one -one domestic abuse support. And the findings? And the findings. <laughs> so. Um, so we've been operational for just coming on two years now. Uh, we're finding in terms of the people accessing the service, um, there are indeed barriers because they are hard to reach. Victims of domestic abuse, um, the majority of the victims are male victims as being probably the biggest group within that demographic of our service. Um, about 25% identify as LGBTI plus um, and about 10, 15% come from black minority ethnic communities. What we find specifically is that there are different barriers for the different groups that we work with. Um, I know that you had some representation last week from Abuse Men in Scotland and Alison Walk talked about specific barriers for men. Um, that being specifically ideas around masculinity, men don't necessarily relate to domestic abuse or don't see it as something that impacts or affects men. Uh, same goes for LGBTI communities. The public narrative around domestic abuse, uh, which we've had over the last 40 years driven forward by the women's uh, services are that you know, something that men do to women, and that's very much been the public narrative. An unintended consequence of that has been that some other groups don't necessarily identify too readily with domestic abuse. Um, so that public narrative, LGBTI relationships, people don't see themselves in what's portrayed in the media or in other services, less likely to recognize domestic abuse when it happens and less likely to access support. Um, so there are a lot of challenges in terms of engaging people around that. Okay. Some of the panel members may have more questions on that later, Catherine. Any comments on that? Or oh, sorry. No, um, the, I, mean, I think, um, as Aaron says, that um, obviously Social Work Scotland would be very much supportive of the work that's happened over, around domestic abuse and the gender analysis that we've had of that. But equally, we recognise that there um, are many people across Scotland experiencing domestic abuse, and each of those experiences will be unique to those individuals. Um, there will be unique barriers to those individuals in terms of reporting. Um, and as we move forward, it is important that we take an inclusive um, approach whilst recognising that um, domestic abuse is a gender um, based issue in Scotland, um, so we're absolutely supportive of projects by own authority. I, I think works um, with the Fearless Project, and that's been um, helpful for us in terms of thinking about that at a local level as well. Thank you, Fulton. Yeah, that's going to be the, uh, panel, we've heard some evidence um, from the Scottish Police Federation that um, suggests that tackling the, the approach to tackling domestic abuse is based uh, solely on punishment. Would you would you recognise uh, this analysis? In terms of domestic abuse at the moment, um, with the response being focused on punishment, I think that's probably largely due to lack of rehabilitation programs across the country, uh, or where they are provided, it's a bit more patchy, uh, it's a bit of a postcode lottery in terms of where rehabilitation is available. Um, certainly with any type of crime, domestic abuse especially, the rehabilitation aspect is really important given the number of repeat offences around domestic abuse. Um, so any shift from punishment towards rehabilitation would be a really welcome measure, um, especially to help perpetrators of domestic abuse to understand and address their patterns of behaviour and to make positive changes. What, what, what do you think um, you, we could do to, um, to enhance interventions that have been in place? I mean, my background before becoming an MSP was in the criminal justice social work sector, so I'm fully aware of some of the stuff that's been done, but I suppose the point I am, I'm asking is what do you think could be done to make these interventions more effective? Firstly, to stop reoffending, and secondly, to prevent any offending in the first place. And importantly, how do we think that how do you think that we can get the um, the public to have trust and faith in these services that that they're they're working um, to those aims? Can I answer that? Yeah. Um, I think 
Right, respond yeah. to that. Um, I think um, <laughs> in, in terms of, of how we move forward um, in, in terms of rehabilitation of offenders, I, I, I read the evidence that was given um, by the Police Federation and the focus on punishment. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that from a social work perspective. I think that we are very clearly focused on rehabilitation um, and have a clear belief that um, we should be working with people, with perpetrators of domestic abuse to identify opportunities for change and to support those opportunities for change. Um, I think we have had a lot of focus on perpetrator programmes um, and, and we recognise that um, there are differences in the delivery of those programmes and availability of those programmes across the country um, but perhaps it's helpful for us to also think beyond perpetrator programmes in terms of rehabilitation um, and focus on a, our broader whole systems approach to perpetrators and I think the bill is extremely helpful in focusing on the behaviour of perpetrators and encouraging that across our whole system. Um, your witnesses in your previous session this morning spoke about the Safe and Together approach, which is being um, implemented by a number of local authorities and which um, encourages practitioners across the whole system to have a very clear focus on the behaviour of perpetrators, to see domestic abuse as a parenting choice and to recognise the impact um, of coercive control and be very clear about that behaviour and its impact on all those that are affected. Um, and I think that brings um, a focus on um, perpetrators, on early intervention, um, across our whole system, not just in social work and children and families, social work as well as criminal justice, but across all the services we work with, including with our named persons um, and lead professionals within our, our GARFEC approach as well. So I think there is um, much potential um, for us to think beyond what we are currently doing, um, to build on the foundations we have in terms of perpetrator programmes, um, but to expand our, our thinking and our, our attitudes um, in terms of identifying working with perpetrators at a much earlier stage, and the bill, as it's written, is very much supportive of that approach. Do you, do you think it, it's um, so much about identifying and working with perpetrators at an earlier stage, or is it, is it perhaps part of that, but also what we heard in the last uh, evidence session there, it's actually about um, sort of trying to change um, cultural attitudes. So maybe even, for example, within schools, being more open and talking about it, so that because um, because we, we all know, I think it's generally agreed that you know domestic abuse is about uh, you know control and power, uh, and it is mainly, well, not exclusively, uh, of course, but mainly uh, perpetrated by males and females. So, do you think that even um, you know trying to um, address it at an even earlier stage than actually trying to identify a possible perpetrator? The, you know, as a possibility, and that, that can be my, my last yeah, question on that. Again, absolutely agree. A, a kind of whole systems approach um, from the earliest intervention is absolutely um, appropriate in terms of both general public awareness raising. And, and again, I think the bill offers opportunities to raise the profile of domestic abuse as a pattern of coercion and control rather than as a single instance of physical violence, um, which has been, although that narrative in Scotland has been changing for a number of years, there is still um, public attitude surveys would still um, support the, the fact that the majority of members of the public still believe that domestic abuse is focused on physical violence or see that certainly as more serious than other forms of abuse. Um, and absolutely um, a commitment from um, social work as well as from other local partners to um, earliest intervention in terms of um, relationship education in schools, that focusing on this respect and equality um, and working with young people um, to support them to identify those who are at risk of harm um, at the earliest possible stage um, and to intervene appropriately and support young people um, within the context of our, our GARFEC agenda as well. Sorry, Aaron. Yeah. I was going to say, I think... Um, in addition to that, more voluntary programmes uh, for people who are either perpetrators or identified as being at risk of being perpetrators of abuse. At the moment, the Caledonian system is a court-mandated programme, and I think Edinburgh City Council is one of the few areas where there's actually a voluntary programme uh, for people who are abusive. Um, so more programmes, I think, where people will access that support at an earlier stage rather than waiting for it to go through the criminal justice system and have a court mandate that they attend a group programme. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, following the first session, just when we, we broke into um, to suspend for a minute or two, a lady in, who'd been listening in the gallery suggested, she was from India, and she suggested early intervention in schools in terms of anger management. Would that be something that would make sense? 
Uh, in terms of domestic abuse, um, I think it's broadly recognised by agencies in um, social work and agencies working with women, children, young people, as well as our criminal justice partners, that anger management is not necessarily um, an appropriate response. And certainly in the vast majority of cases of domestic abuse, we understand that domestic abuse is not caused by anger and an inability to control anger. In fact, many perpetrators display an uh, um, excellent ability to control mm. anger in particular circumstances um, when it best suits their needs and agenda. Um, we understand in Scotland that domestic abuse is a function of gender inequality and other structural inequalities such as poverty and that our focus needs to be on um, raising awareness of, of that reality um, and of challenging those issues. So um, certainly a focus with young people would be around respect and equality, how to manage conflict within relationships because we absolutely acknowledge that relationships will include conflict um, but how to do that healthily and with respect um, and without resorting to um, management uh, to managing that in, in abusive um, uh, ways whether that's physical violence or around psychological and emotional abuse I, I think she was thinking about children just managing their behavior just yes, generally absolutely we have a, a, an off an offshoot I don't know if Aaron if you have any comments on that uh, it's a difficult one I think yeah work early on is going to be more effective and it's in line with the equally safe strategy in terms of early interventions. Um, as Catherine said, uh, perpetrators of abuse are very controlled and they mm -hmm. can control that anger when it suits them. Um, and I suppose there's maybe a distinction to be made between uh, more situational violence where mm -hmm. someone uh, has an outburst of anger and responds in a way that might not necessarily be underpinned by that pattern of coercion and control and behaviour. Um, so I think any interventions need to make that distinction that's helpful. Liam, was it a supplementary? Yeah, we haven't talked an awful lot about rehabilitation. I'd be curious about the, um, the, the success rate, as it were, of, of rehabilitation programmes, recognising that it's going to be a continuum of, of people from, from probably the more moderate end in terms of behaviour patterns through to those who, who are very, very challenging and where the, the, the outcomes have, have perhaps uh, less prospect of success. I mean, what, what is the general experience of, of the success of rehabilitation uh, programmes generally in this country? I see that's a hugely contested area. Unfortunately, yeah. I probably don't have a straightforward answer for you. Um, the Caledonian programme, which is delivered, I think, across 13 local authorities in Scotland, was evaluated, um, and that report um, was uh, published at the end of last year. Um, and it did show some positive um, impact. Um, so the participant... Um, Participants in the programme, whether that be um, perpetrators of domestic abuse, and these are all men who have been convicted um, and are mandated to attend the programme um, as part of their community sentence, um, the staff who participate, and also um, the women, the partners or ex-partners of those um, men who are mandated to the programme, um, did rate the programme highly. Women reported feeling safer. Um, men um, were assessed by um, their uh, criminal justice social workers as posing a lower risk to women and children uh, by the end of the programme. However, the uh, evaluation is also extremely clear that, that it can't conclusively demonstrate an impact of the, prog of the um, programme and some of the psychometric analysis, the testing and analysis that was done um, as part of the report um, offered a more mixed picture in terms of women's views about perpetrators' change in behaviour as well. Um, so there has also been some multi-site studies done across the UK um, by um, Project Mirabal in 2015, um, which were all around respect accredited programmes. And again, some encouraging um, uh, results in terms of the impact so that most men stopped um, using violence and reduced most other forms of abuse. Most partners felt, felt that they said that they felt safer and were safer. And it was recognised that programmes made a unique contribution um, to helping perpetrators to make steps towards change um, and also in terms of um, forming part of a local coordinated community response um, to domestic abuse. But again, acknowledging that overall there was absolutely a continuum of change for men. So some men may have made very little change in terms of their behaviour and some may have made very significant changes. From what you were describing there, it almost suggests that the, the focus of those programmes has, has generally been on on instances where there, there may have been uh, physical violence as opposed to the, the kind of coercive controlling behaviour that we're talking about in the, in the context of this bill. Is that a fair assessment or uh, has, it, has it been cast more broadly? I think programmes, um, certainly respect accredited programmes, um, 
are designed to take in the entirety of that behaviour. Mm. So the conviction for which um, the perpetrator has been mandated to the programme is more likely to be related to a physical incident, a one-off incident, as we've heard already, that's where our, our legislation is currently focused. So the likelihood is a conviction would, would relate to that type of incident-based um, domestic abuse. Um, but the programme, and I know from uh, work with my crim criminal justice social work colleagues locally, but across Scotland, that um, those social workers are extremely skilled in terms of supporting men to look at their behaviour in terms of that, um, um, in terms of looking at coercive control um, and controlling behaviour, and that the respect accredited programmes absolutely encourage that response. And just one brief uh, final question. Do you, would you see the, the, the bill and the way that the bill is cast uh, increasing the likelihood of referrals to um, these sorts of, of programmes or, or less likely because the, the, the focus is, uh, I suppose, on, on um, identifying the actions of, of perpetra perpetrators and, and, and putting in place safeguards for, for those both largely women but, 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 but also um, uh, children in the household who are who are uh, suffering as a result of this. I mean, what, what would be your impression of the way that the bill is cast? And is there anything that we should be looking at in terms of the bill's provisions that may um, heighten the, the, the opportunity around um, rehabilitation where that is appropriate? Um, I think our view of Social Work Scotland would very much be that um, the, the bill as it is cast at the moment um, we, we know it's in the financial memorandum that there are some estimates in terms of the likely increase in reporting, prosecution and conviction um, and likely increases in community sentences. Um, obviously, where a community sentence is imposed, um, there is a process of assessment, so not all perpetrators will be suitable um, to come on to a mandated um, programme. Um, there needs to be some acknowledgement of the offence and some acknowledgement of um, the need for change and, and a motivation to do that, um, and that will not be the case for all perpetrators. Um, so we would expect in the natural course of things as the bill is implemented um, that there will um, we will see more reporting hopefully and um, that we will eventually re result in more convictions and therefore there will be more men who um, are mandated onto the programs and we would absolutely welcome that as a um, widening access for the opportunity for change for men um, and in terms of the impact that will have for victims and for children um, there is a lot in the bill that absolutely aligns with the approach that is taken within programs so a focus on the behavior a focus on the impact on the victim and accountability for that behaviour and its impact. Um, so I think the bill absolutely supports, and the way, the way that it's framed, supports the work that criminal justice social workers are already doing within programmes, but also in their one-to-one -one work with perpetrators as well. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Uh, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, the intention of the bill is to require the court to consider more often whether or not to impose a non-harassment order. And we've heard that some of the children's organisations, in fact, all of them say that they thought that should be applied uh, specifically to children as well. I just wonder if you want to comment, um, Catherine, particularly on what you think the implications of that might be on the sort of resources and workload of the social work system. And the Glasgow Bar Association have raised some concerns that this might create extra pressure on, on you know, other personnel if, if prosecutors aren't expected to provide the background information. Okay. Um, I think in the Social Work Scotland's um, submission, this, this point was raised in terms of the, the moment that the bill is silent on the sources of information that the court might take into account. Um, although I think we were encouraged um, to see that in Anne-Marie Hicks's evidence um, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. that her um, clarification that from her perspective... You wouldn't need to. The uh -huh. expectation uh -huh. would be that uh -huh. that burden, if you like, um, uh -huh. in the first instance, would fall on the Crown Office. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And also having reviewed the protocol that's in place currently between the Crown Office and Police Scotland... Um, we are assured that that is um, already well embedded in guidance and in practice. Um, so whilst um, Social Work Scotland would absolutely be supportive of um, the providing information in addition to that that is available through the police and through the Crown Office, um, we recognise that it's probably appropriate in most cases that the current practice is followed and that the primary source of information um, is from, from those agencies with criminal justice social work um, mm -hmm. able to provide that through reports when requested by the court. Um, so mm -hmm. we don't see that that would have a um, hugely significant impact mm -hmm. um, if practice continues um, as it currently is in the framing of the bill mm -hmm. as it is at the moment. Okay. What's your view on the non-harassment orders being um, extended to, to children as well as you know, to the victim? Yeah. Um, 
Social Work Scotland is supportive of the, um, of the views of um, children, women and children's agencies that, the, um, ag that if the aggravation recognises the child as a victim of harm, that is therefore a logical um, kind of follow-on that the non-harassment orders should also be um, extended to cover children. Mm -hmm. um, we do um, recognise the practice issues that have been raised, particularly where there is um, conflicting orders in place. So there may be a non-harassment order in place for the adult victim of the abuse, generally the mother, um, and then there are contact orders put in place and the conflict between that, and that can cause um, obviously huge issues for the, the women and their children, but also so in terms of the management of that from um, social work in between criminal justice, social work and um, children and mm -hmm. family services as well. Um, so we can see that that will, will strengthen the protection of children and the principle that children should be equally protected is absolutely um, important. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in Thank agreement you. with that. Aaron, would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, just the same as what Catherine's been saying. We support the uh, consideration of non-harassment orders at sentence um, and the extension to children as well. Um, covering all the ground, but again, the same issues around uh, the non-abusive parents getting protection, but if the children aren't and the complications that can come from that. Mm -hmm. um, so SACRO is supportive of those provisions. That, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Fulton? Yeah, um, in the last uh, panel, uh, we talked a wee bit about um, aggravation. I'm just wondering if, um, if, if both of you uh, think that the proposed aggravation um, in relation to the child for this law is, is sufficient or if you think um, like colleagues in the previous panel um, did that it should be wider and also and I asked the previous panel as well so I'll just double this up in my question um, if you th what role you think the children's hearing system uh, can have um, in relation to these offences uh, do you think they'll be similar to the role it can have in the current legislation um, in terms of the um, aggravator, um, I think Social Work Scotland, again, as absolutely welcomes the provisions within the bill um, as a really important step um, to further recognise the experiences of children and young people and the impact that domestic abuse has, the very serious harm that it can cause for um, children and young people. Um, but we also, like other um, um, witnesses, agree that, that might, the provision may not be perfect. Um, we certainly um, would um, welcome some clarity regarding the terms in the bill um, in terms of um, that children might be present um, and what that, what that actually means. Does that mean present in the room? Does it mean in the, in the household? Um, what does that mean in terms of an unborn child and all the research that we um, know is there about the very significant risk that women face during pregnancy um, and the immediate um, period after that? So, so can I just um, uh, interrupt you? What, what, what do you think it should be? Um, I think that we would like it to be um, as inclusive as possible for all of the reasons that were, um, I'm not going through them all again, the evidence no. from this morning, but that, that we absolutely recognise that a child does not need to be present in a room um, in order for them to be significantly impacted by domestic abuse. Um, the, the, just the fact that they live in a household where there is an ongoing pattern of um, control and abuse um, can have very significant impacts. And I think people referred this morning to the tension in, in that home um, and all the many, many ways in which, which children are impacted on a day and daily basis um, by that experience. So we would we'd support um, a, a broad um, and inclusive um, aggravator um, which recognises um, all of the different situations in which um, children find themselves um, in terms of domestic abuse. Um, again, yeah, the impact that it has on children who are not just present, but members of the family, um, the overall impact on children whenever they don't they aren't in the next room, they don't witness it, but it will still have an impact on them. Um, supportive of the aggravator, but I'm conscious that as the bill was initially drafted, that aggravator wasn't there in the initial stages, and I don't know if separate parallel legislation might be required to fully embody the experiences of children um, and offer further protection there. But I think as a first step, broadening the aggravator just by acknowledging children in the family uh, would be a positive step. It was covered extensively in the first session, so it's good to have um, your view as well. Um, ben, followed by John. Thank you, Convener. I, I just, Aaron, I just wanted to pick up a, a few points on in, in your evidence, written evidence. Thank, thank you for that. Um, you, I, like LGBTI Youth Scotland, you also uh, pick up on the LGBTI community specifically and um, various uh, fears and, and, and concerns and, and barriers um, that, which face that community. 
at present when it comes to, to domestic abuse. You, you speak about the need for a, a concentrated publicity campaign uh, should this bill become the will of Parliament. I wondered if you could just expand on, on the importance of that as you see it. Sure. Um, you know, the bill overall, we're very supportive of it and it's a really positive step forward. Uh, but the main concern um, that I would have is that for the bill to be effective, the implementation is key, and for it to be properly implemented and to protect everyone that it has the potential of protecting, there needs to be a concerted publicity campaign around uh, broadening the public understanding of what domestic abuse is beyond the physical violence, beyond men's violence to women, that actually it is a pattern of coercion and controlling behaviour, that it does affect people regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity, and it transcends different identities. Um, the biggest barrier for LGBTI people might be recognising, as I said at the beginning, uh, recognising domestic abuse when it's happening. They don't relate to the public narrative. They don't see themselves as being victims of domestic abuse. Um, and when you don't recognise it, you can't reach out for support. You can't report it. Um, and then if there is a recognition that what you're experiencing is domestic abuse, anxieties around reporting it to the police, going through a very public court system, which I know Brandy Lee touched on from LGBT of Scotland, um, uh, if someone's not out to their friends or family, that's going to be a massive barrier. They're not going to report that and they're not going to be able to get the support that they need. Um, so publicity around the new offence is very important to help people recognise where it's happening, um, not just for public confidence, but also, I suppose, linked into publicity is the training aspect as well for prosecutors, for the police, for the judiciary, uh, when interpreting this legislation and psychological harm and the relevant effects. What does that look like for people who identify as LGBT? Um, how is coercion used in these relationships? What are the intricacies in these relationships? And how does that manifest? So I think there's a lot of work to be done on the back of this uh, to make it successful. Thank you, and, and thank you for also touching on the, the issue of sharing information and a, a risk, a need for a, a risk management approach around that. Just very briefly, convener, in, in your written evidence, uh, from SACRO, there's also a, a, a reference to the introduction of a, a standard bail condition prohibiting the accused from personally obtaining recognitions or statements from a complainer in relation to the new offence as an appropriate safeguarding measure. I wonder if you could just uh, elaborate on that. Sure. Um, I think, you know, if the accused was able to obtain recognitions or conduct their own defence, that would further re-victimise the victim. Um, traumatize them. It's an opportunity for that, for the abuser to exert further control. Um, when they're doing their own defense or obtaining precognitions, they will be very skilled and manipulative and know what buttons to press, how to get under the victim's skin. And I think for the criminal justice system to allow that to happen uh, would be a grave mistake, because uh, I think the justice system would then be complicit in the abuse of that victim in a manner of speaking. Um, so we would support any move to restrict that from happening. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, John. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, panel. It's a, it's a question for yourself, Catherine, and it's about the written evidence and, and the last two, two, two sentences indeed in it. If I, if I may quote, um, the intended impact of this bill when implemented, um, it's obviously if implemented, mm -hmm. is to hold perpetrators to account and secure the safe and secure future of victims and families. Now, I know many people listening in on this um, hopefully will understand the rationale for discussions around rehabilitation, but it's certainly a view that nothing should be done to facilitate perpetrators once again having access to, to the opportunities to um, inflict their damage on uh, families. Would you agree that that's... Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, Social Work Scotland, along with other agencies, are absolutely committed um, to the idea that the bill um, and um, all of the, the, the system that sits around about it, um, it should be focused on the protection, um, not just of current victims, but of any potential future victims as, as well. And, and all that we do um, in our local partnerships and community planning is absolutely fo focused on that public protection um, element, as well as preventing um, prevention in, in, in terms of the elements that we spoke of earlier um, as well. So, so absolutely agree with that. Thank you. And, and the very last sentence is, uh, if I may quote Karina, is it, it will be important to align in a consistent manner the operational impact of the present legislation with the multi-agency work being undertaken to deliver equally safe. I'm, I'm trying to, to, to think of the, the, where this legislation to pass, the practical implications, because a lot of our discussion has been around the presumption that it will be the police 
the, to initiate everything. The reality is that, of course, child and family social work teams have regular engagement and will be aware of some of this conduct already. Would you envisage that, as it, were this bill to pass, that they would be the catalyst for advising the police of this conduct on recognition that it is criminal, Catherine? Um, I think that, um, as um, I think Leslie Bow and her evidence um, suggested, that the reality is that on the ground our practitioners um, and the police and, and um, social work, whether that's in children and family services or in criminal justice social work, um, are very much dealing with the reality of the behaviour that is um, reflected in the bill on a day-to-day -day basis. They already deal with coercive and controlling behaviour as a pattern of abuse. Um, they are currently in the position where not all of that behaviour is criminalised, um, but that nonetheless um, means that they are working with families and um, are taking forward appropriate interventions. So while some of the behaviour may not be criminal, it may have a, a, an impact on a child or young person that brings that into um, the concern in terms of um, wellbeing in GERFEC or in terms of our child protection responsibilities. Um, so we are absolutely working, as you say, with those families and recognising that. And we'd seek to continue, um, certainly in my own authority, where we're implementing the Safe and Together model to be partnering with the non-abusing parent, um, to be supporting them to recognise um, the perpetrator's pattern of behaviour and the impact on both them and their children. Um, and also to recognise the many things that women do on a day-to-day -day basis um, to protect their children, but to think with them about how we best work together with them um, to um, protect them, um, to protect their children, um, and to help them to move on and to recover from that experience. So um, it would be about us working with victims and their families um, and about intervening um, in a supportive way, but of course there will be times when um, social criminal justice, um, sorry, children and family social work will have to take um, measures to protect children where that is merited um, and using their existing statutory powers to do that as well. And, and of course because of this level of regular engagement it's not necessarily going to be the case that information disclosed which would were this to pass constitute a crime would necessarily come to light as a result of a joint investigation with police officers. Mm -hmm. Indeed perhaps more likely it would come out from day-to-day -day engagement with social workers. Yes. Are you able to suggest what the tipping point would be for reporting that to, to, to the police? And do you envisage there's much in the way of additional training requirements um, for their staff? Because it, it's a, clearly a significant burden on them. It's very difficult to say, obviously. Each case would be um, individual um, and the circumstances would need to be assessed against the existing um, legislation and responsibilities in terms of um, child protection. What I would say is that, obviously, we have very well embedded multi-agency systems for doing that, so it wouldn't be necessarily be a decision of social work. We're moving much more towards making shared decisions um, as a multi-agency groups and in line with the GERFEC um, practice model. Um, it's, there's no doubt that for all agencies there will be training um, and uh, implications, um, as a number of witnesses have, have spoken to you um, about, and that will of course include um, social work practitioners. Um, so, so yes, there will be a need for some training, but I would reiterate that this is something that our um, social work colleagues work with day and daily. Um, it is the reality of domestic abuse is that um, it is um, a, an, an issue that impacts on many hundreds and thousands of women and children across Scotland. Many of them are already in contact with our social work services um, and that our um, practitioners have built up skills um, um, around that. So we're looking to build on the strength that is there, um, but we absolutely acknowledge that there is always room for further training aware and improvement in terms of practice as well. Thank you very much. And, and very finally, you do talk about multi-agency work um, being undertaken to deliver the outcomes of Equally Safe. So yes. it, it, were this to pass, this is entirely consistent with Equally Safe. Are you able to maybe just give a, a short comment on what Equally Safe is then, please, just for the record? Yes, purposes. Equally Safe is Scotland's uh, national approach um, to tackling violence against women and girls. Um, it's, um, I can't remember, it was originally published, I think, 2014, but it's revised um, recently to take better account of um, the impact of um, various forms of violence against women and children and young people. Um, and at the moment, the um, delivery plan that sits alongside that was consulted on last year. Um, so it's is, 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 um, still, still in draft, I think, um, and to be published um, at some point this year. But it contains a wide range of actions um, and a very clear shift towards a preventative focus. Um, but there are um, priorities in it that very much relate to um, holding perpetrators accountable for their behaviour um, and ensuring that women, children and young people are protected by um, justice responses as well. Um, so very much in line with the, um, the provisions of the bill as they're drafted. Okay, many thanks indeed for that. Uh -huh. Thank you. And finally, Mary. Uh, thank you. 
It was just in relation to some of the other proposed reforms to the criminal procedure evidence and sentencing, and we've touched on some of those already today. Um, but it was really just to ask um, both of you if you had any other particular issues you would like to highlight in relation to those, or if you were broadly in agreement with, with some of the other uh, proposed procedures. I think from Social Work Scotland's perspective, um, we um, are supportive of those changes, um, particularly those that um, pre um, prevent the possibility of a perpetrator further using the justice system to um, victimise um, their partner or their ex-partner. Um, as Aaron's already said, that, that those are important loopholes to close, and I think we've recognised that in other contexts of violence against women, particularly around sexual offences <coughs> legislation, and it's absolutely appropriate that that's extended um, to victims of domestic abuse. Yeah, and just as I said before, I think the uh, reforms to the procedures are welcome, um, closes the loopholes, better protection to victims, um, and prevents re-traumatisation. Uh, so yeah, nothing really extra to add on that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That concludes our line of question. Can I thank you both very much for attending and giving evidence to the, the committee today? And with that, I'll suspend briefly to allow witnesses to leave. Agenda item two is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 15th of June 2017. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments from the questions uh, or questions. And I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. As Mary Fee isn't present today, I'll provide the following feedback. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on 15th of June when it took evidence on the deployment of police body-worn video cameras. The subcommittee heard that the evaluations of the use of body-worn video cameras by other police forces and in the North East Division of Police Scotland had highlighted a number of benefits and some potential drawbacks. Police Scotland is now looking at the possibility of a national rollout of body-worn video cameras across the police service. Before doing so, improvements will need to be made to Police Scotland's ICT infrastructure and potentially the ICT of those in the wider criminal justice system. And initial and maintenance costs will need to be quantified. The subcommittee will next meet on the 22nd of June when it will hear from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary uh, for Scotland in Scotland, Derek Penman, on his report on openness and transparency at the Scottish Police Authority. Do members have any questions? Liam? Not a question, Convener, just a, a, an additional comment. I thought it was a, a very useful session. Um, I, I, I think some of what we heard about um, the findings coming out of the, the pilot, particularly in the North East, were encouraging across a, a range of different indicators. But I think quite sensibly what we also heard was a recognition from Police Scotland um, that until they have an IT infrastructure that will um, support going down this route and, and until they have, a, I think, a better handle on the, the likely costs, um, upfront capital costs and ongoing revenue costs, um, I, I think they were taking a, a, a sensibly cautious approach to a national rollout, but it's something we'll return to. But nevertheless, I think um, in terms of the, the impact on um, uh, police um, safety, on, uh, the impact on officers, um, I think the, the impact in terms of uh, early pleas in, in, in cases that, are, uh, that, that, that come forward in a range of different areas, th th some of those findings were, were very encouraging. Good. Any other comments? I certainly find it useful to actually see the cameras and um, have an idea of what we were talking about and, and to hear um, the evidence of how they've been deployed and the, um, 
the reports back on that. So I think it was a very worthwhile session. Uh, there being no questions, that concludes our 23rd meeting of 2017. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 27th of June when we'll take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. Yeah, what for? We have a quick chat in private, Ben. <laughs> Gallery now clear, please. Thank you. <laughs>